All right. Now I'm going to be jumping around to a few different passages today, and uh, but we're going to be in Samuel. The um, we're going to be in Second Samuel. We're going to jump back around First and Second Samuel. But uh, in Second um, Samuel, we're going to start out. Um, <clears throat> Uh, start out in, near chapter 13, and if uh, we had to title this uh, message, it probably would be, what What kind of a friend are you? I mean, what friend are you? Um, now, I had two friends growing up, and, and um, I, I would use this analogy based off of both of them. I forgot to power this bad boy up here. There we go. So I, um, I had two uh, different kind of friends growing up. Um, and of these two friends, one encouraged me, um, and one discouraged me. Uh, one of them, believe it or not, was, uh, very instrumental in my, my prayer walk, my Bible reading, and was always an encouragement to continue up on things that I didn't want to do. The other was very instrumental in encouraging me to do things that I shouldn't be doing. You know, here's how we could get by with your parents not knowing. Here's how we could do this. Here's, and both of them had a, um, a big impact in my life. And so an analogy is what kind of a friend are you? The, in this story, we'll actually read about two different, completely dis- different and distinct friends. Now, we're going to start off in uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 13. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. Uh, the son of Shimea, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. Now, if I'm to say that um, something, I'm going to do something subtly, I'm going to do it, care- I mean, you know, I'm, it's a completely different word. This word, when it's talking about a person, when they're saying that they're subtle, if you were to look up on Google, this friend number one that we're going to be utilizing today is a subtle person. The, the Google would essentially classify it as cleverly uses indirect methods to achieve something. So this person's very subtle. So it would be an AKA they are crafty, they are cunning, or that they are sly. Now we've all can probably think in our head of somebody that we knew growing up, or that we know currently, that is crafty, cunning, or they're sly. Maybe somebody that uh, you, it might pull to mind as a, a car salesman. You know? They're, they're, they're saying, oh, this is a mechanic special. And, you know, what is a mechanic special? I mean, or I mean uh, that it was owned by a mechanic. So what does that usually tell you? That it's always been up in the air getting worked on. And then some people would say, oh, that means it's a good vehicle. And sometimes it's like, oh, not all the times. I mean, it's this has always been worked on and never could get fixed. And, but guess what? It's a, it's a perfect vehicle for you. This is a subtle person. Now, what does Amnon's friend Jonadab say? And he says to him in verse 4, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon tells him in the end of verse 4, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So now we find something different here. Now, when th- this is a, a half sister, you know, different mother, same father, and um, he's telling her that I love Tamar, and then he ref- refers to her as my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab says unto him, Lie down on thy bed and make thyself sick. Now, I don't know if anyone else has done this, but I mean, I definitely wouldn't. 
but has anyone ever pretended that they are sick so they didn't have to go to school? Now, I don't need to see hands here, but I can imagine in your heart you probably were like, <clears throat> yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, we, we've all done that, like, I'm so sick. You know, and take that thermometer and take it on your fingers and rub it really fast so it gets nice and hot. <sighs> You know, and look at I have a hundred and ten degree. You know, you, you, you guys have been there, right? As kids, we've all we've all been there. You try. You don't want to go to school. I just want to stay home and, and play in my video game. And you know what? My mom, she was smart enough to to know this. She goes, "Well, if you're staying at home, you're not going to be." And my thing was, I, I mean, obviously, that we didn't have the video game consoles that they have today when I was growing up. We did have one, but my mom's like, well, if you're going, not going to school, you can't play on this console. I was like, oh, well, I could play on my, I'm like, my other thing, my, my toy of choice was cars, like the Matchbox cars, and I, I, I'm not even, I'm not embellishing, you could ask my mom sometime, I would line them up into categories. Trucks were over here, cars were at your, race cars were here, and then, and then I would bring a clunker car in, and I would trade and sell that other car to this person. I don't know why, I, that was, I was just a weird kid. And so I would line these cards up, and I would do this stuff, and, and I, my mom told me, well, you can't play with cars. And then my next go-to was Legos, you can't play with Legos. You literally have to be in your bed sleeping the whole time you would be in school. Now, I know this is a shock to you, but as a, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year old, I did not enjoy sleeping. I know, shocker. I wanted to be up. I wanted to play. I wanted to have fun. And so when my mom hit me with that, oh no, I have to be in bed and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good enough to go to school. I, I'm feeling better now, and my cough is gone. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and this person, he's a grown man. He's a grown-up. He's a big boy. And he says, hey, go lay down and pretend that you're sick. I remember one time when, like, it, it was always a thing, Does, is Jason playing sick because sometimes I just I was not good at school and I hated it and I was I was not happy with it and so they would are you really sick they would take take the temperature they would do all these things they would try to give me medicine to see if I could be cured enough to go to school with a cough I remember one time I was at church and it was like Monday morning is the next day and I was saying I don't feel so good my dad's like well just go in your room play a little bit and they're making some food and I remember falling back on my bed and I'm just like I don't feel you know just like laying there and then there the dinner bell got called you know you know like you know, someone yells out dinner and so you're all supposed to come up to the table to eat and I couldn't move I, I remember just laying there like I can't move. I was just out of energy I was done and I remember my dad he always wears boots Oh, still to this day, where's those, those, um, those uh, heeled boots? And you could always hear them on the hardwood floor. And you knew that you were in trouble. If you heard that seat pull out, you know, that runk on the floor, and then gadoosh, gadoosh, gadoosh. And, you know, you're like, I'm dead, I'm dead. Lord, come now. Just don't, you know, and, and you're thinking, I, I am in trouble. And I remember him coming in, looking at me, laying down the bed, puts his hand on me, you are sick. You know, and then putting me asleep, putting, putting me to the bed to, to lay down. Now, this is essentially, this is what every parent has done. You know, they'll test to see, is that kid sick? So he says, lay down and make yourself sick. Lay down and pretend. So verse 5, And Jonadab said unto him, lay, lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see, say unto him, Pray thee, I let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, 
and eat it at her hand. Now, this right here, I, I really, I'd like to ask everybody, did, now this is a, a telling question, did Jonadab tell Amnon to do anything morally wrong? Like, really, really bad. You say, he's, well, he is telling him to lie to his dad, but is he telling him to do anything after lying to his dad? No. No, he's not. But let's look at what happens. So Amnon, in verse 6, lays down, makes himself sick, and when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let my sister come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat it at her hand. Almost follows every word of what Jonadab tells him to do. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So if we were to kind of sit there today and watch from a bird's eye view of what's going on at the house, he's saying, oh, I'm so sick. And then the word gets to dad. Now, this is a big concern. What's going on? Should I bring the doctors in? So he's going in. He's a grown man, but he's going into his house and he's you know, separate from the king's house. And he's going into his place and he's like, you know, what's going on? And, and you know, probably te checking his temperature. Oh, yeah, you are warm. What's going on? Oh, man, I just, I don't feel so good. You know what would make me feel really good? What, what, what? You know, if, if, she, if my sister Tamar would come and do like a hibachi-style grill right in front of me, and then, you know, do the cooking and everything, and maybe not wear a chef's hat, but, you know, but go do a cooking and, and you know, make it all look really good. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smell, you know, it'll smell good. It'll, it'll make me hungry. I can eat it, maybe feel better. Now, i got to ask you, who has ever was in like a back bedroom of your house and somebody started cooking and the fumes started making their way to your room and you got hungry? Anybody? Oh, that's happened to me. I tell you, I've, I've had times where I've been in, my, in my, uh, one of the back rooms at our house doing work, doing computer work and, and uh, you know, making jobs, getting lined up. And I wasn't hungry, not, not even thought about it. And, I, and I'm not thinking getting a bag of chips or nothing. And then I'm smelling some aroma coming down the way. And at that moment, like instant, I was hungry. You know, like, oh, that smells so good. And, you know, I can't even think anymore. You know, I'm having a hard time concentrating on the job I was trying to do. It smells so good. And then I'm thinking, oh, when is it ready? You know, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm hungry. I'm ready to eat. And so this effect with food does happen. And so there, David, he's looking at thinking, you know, that's a good idea. That's a smart idea. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe he smells some good food. He'll, he'll eat it. He'll feel better. So he sends for Tamar in verse 8. And she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight. Now, there's many different cakes that they can make. There's this one, I was watching this one video. Um, I, I can't remember exactly where it was. I, I feel like it was somewhere in like, in, um, like Vietnam area. But um, this, uh, they're, they're going out to like a street vendor. And this person, he has like the dough, they rolled out the dough and they put some vegetables and some meat in there and they pounded it together and like, you know, crimped the sides and everything, flipped it in the oil, spun it around. And the person was like, man, that looks good. And he's smelling, oh, man, that smells good. And, you know, the worst part watching these people on, on YouTube is they're eating it, and you're upset because you want to try it too. And then they're, like, they, she took the chopsticks, and she goes, she's watching a guy, like, uh, open it up. And she's like, that does, okay, let me, let me copy what he's doing. And cuts it open with chopsticks and, and starts digging and eating it just like the other guy. And she goes, oh, it is good. And, you know, she's all eating it. And you're thinking, I really want to eat that too. And I can imagine if we were sitting here today, this is exactly what's happening. She's probably rolling that dough out. And one thing that they, they do make that's pretty similar out there is they almost like what we would call like a meat pie. 
you know, they would, they would take some meat and throw it in there and, you know, crimp the sides and, and bake it. And I can imagine she's probably made him something like that. Something like really tasty. Something really good. And she's brought it out completely innocent, not realizing what's happening. You know, if you were to look at something like this in modern day, what is Jonadab guilty of? Now, did Jonadab say, here's what you do? You can go do this evil thing to your sister, your half-sister. You can, you can be a terrible human being. What crime is, Am, is Amnon's friend Jonadab guilty of? The answer is an accessory. You know, in our... In our um, laws that many times, regrettably, don't get followed, there's been times where people have actually said stuff and then they're like, well, you are an accessory to that crime. It would be a case in point. Let's just use an example. And this has happened. You know, I don't agree with this federal ruling so let's go ahead and burn and loot the place. So people get up and they burn and they loot. And I am a high figure. People look at me and they see what I say and then they think, well, I'm going to do it because that person said, let's do it. So I'm going to do it. And they catch that person. And that person says, well, Jason said, let's burn and loot the place. So I did. What would that make me? That would make me an accessory. An accessory to the crime that was committed. But now, like, let's just say, I've actually had this, heard something very similar like this happening, and then the person was really quick to, you know, let me clear the air here. Don't do this. But there was a, there was a, a person that was, um, you know, uh, being a, a nuisance to this person, and the other person goes, hey, um, if I had this happen, man, I just would shoot him. And that person, you could see in their eye, yeah, what kind of a gun would you use? And it's like, whoa, whoa, calm, calm down, calm down. I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying go out and f- kill this person. That would per- leave that one to an accessory to murder. So this man, Jonadab, is an accessory an accessory, in when you're, when you're looking in a legal term, is someone who aided or contributed to the commission or concealment of a crime. Jonadab is a sly guy. You know, he's just all about, let's do whatever you feel like, whatever makes you happy. Well, that's one friend. Now let's look back at um, at uh, First Samuel, and we're going to look. We're going to start in chapter seventeen. Let me, uh, before I move over, because I will be coming back to Second Samuel. I forgot to mark my spot. There we go. And uh, Judge, uh, sorry, not Judges, uh, I went to Judges, wrong one. First Samuel, chapter 17. There we go. Now, this is the battle that happens with, you know, that we know that's David and Goliath. Now, it's very important that we look at that chapter, chapter 17. So this is going to be before another example I'm going to be giving as well. But uh, chapter 17 Near the very end, now this, of this chapter at the very end, David's already killed Goliath. Now, to recap this story, what does David use? Now, this is very important. David used to knock out the giant. 
a stone, stone and sling. But he doesn't kill him. He does, the Bible doesn't say that the giant died. He fell. Now, I don't know if the giant did actually die at that moment. But, and I don't think David did know either. But I'm pretty sure David felt like, I want to make sure. So David, uh, the Bible says, um, smote the giant and severed his body from his head. And he's holding this giant's head. Now, he goes on the attack. He goes on the attack, starts going after the Philistines. Everybody charges after him. David is the hero of the day. And they go and slay all of these people. And they come back. The king says in verse 56, whose son the strapling is. And as David returned from the slaughter, Abner, he's like, he's like what today you would call like the four-star general. Okay, he's, he's the big, important guy. Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And this is one reason I, I love David. I, I really do. He brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Now, I don't... I, I, I've got a warped sense of humor. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I gross some of you out. I don't think David was making it his first puppet, you know, and trying to talk with Goliath's head. But I, you know, personally, what I think is usually was the custom to kind of the, the hair, they would like grow it out a little bit and they would kind of put it up in a bun and such. And I can imagine he's probably grabbing it by his man bun and just holding the head and it's dripping blood everywhere. That's kind of what I imagine it. So he's probably still got that bloody head in his hand, walking up to the king. It's a sight to see. And in verse 58, And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of Jesse, or sorry, thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So this would be like a best friend experience you have right here. You know, this one friend, I had a bad friend I told you about, and I literally knew this guy from practically birth. Like, we were probably fighting in the same crib. I mean, that, that, we knew each other a long time. But this other person that came onto the scene in my life, I really consider still to this day one of my best friends. And he was the one that would encourage me to keep a relationship with Christ. Now, this friend, Jonathan, is becoming a close friend with David. And you, don't want to, you want to know why I personally believe he became such a close, close friend? Is his desire to fight for God pleased Jonathan. If you look at Jonathan, he is very similar to David. If you, want to, if you have any doubts of how they were similar, if you pull back and you look in Samuel chapter 14, um, let's see, and it says, um, Samuel, Samuel chapter 14, and we see in verse 1, it came to pass upon the day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bears armor, come and let us go over to the gar Philistine garrison on the, on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And so he's going up to this area to, to fight. In verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bears armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. He didn't once say that God 
is going to work. He said, it may be. He's just like, let's trust God. Let's see what happens. And I can imagine it when you look at chapter 17, and he's watching David, and there's an age difference. Jonathan is, is older than David. And when you're looking at the two, I can imagine Jonathan's getting a smile like, I like this guy. You know, he's still holding the head. I like him. He's not afraid to fight. This is a cool kid. And the Bible says that his soul, in chapter 18, verse uh, 1, was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let, not let him any more go to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. You know, there is a friend, the Bible does say, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know, I, I got to tell you, and we all have those kind of friends, someone that's got a very close relationship. But I challenge you, you know what's really important more than anything is you need a friend that builds you and not one that pulls you down. You need somebody that encourages you in Christ, not discourages you. It's 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Joshua, or sorry, and Jonathan, I apologize, Jonathan caused... Uh, Wait, 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 wait. There we go. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and, it, and if thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty, and when, he, uh, or, sorry, when thou hast stayed three days, then thou shalt go down quickly and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself when the business was at hand. And shalt remain by the stone as out. And I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof uh, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a lad saying, Go, find the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on this side of thee, then come thou, for this is peace um, to thee, and not hurt as the Lord liveth. But if I say thus unto thee, the young man, Behold, the arrows are beyond thee. Go thy way, for the Lord hath sent thee away. So they do that. They check to see what's Saul's intentions. They're in prayer. They're praying that, God, what is going to happen? And they are pleading with God. This is a guy that's bringing someone closer to, to the Lord. In verse 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have both sworn to us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between thee, me and thee, between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Jonathan protected David, and he instructed him to trust in the Lord. Now, I hope we all have friends just like Jonathan. But some of us might have a friend like Amnon. Now, Amnon's advice, hey, go lay down, pretend you're sick. When dad comes, tell him, you know what would make me so happy if Tamar would come and make me food. He does it, but then he forces his sister. He not only creates a sin, but he creates a sin upon a sin. Not only does he lie to his dad, but he also, he, he also attacks his own sister. In verse, chap, or sorry, chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 13, in verse 20. Now, Absalom has revenge. So Absalom 
uh, is verse 20. Uh, her brother said, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. So the Bible doesn't say what, how long it took. I can imagine it could have been a week, two weeks, three weeks. But the word got to David. David knew what happened. But no justice was even done. And the Bible says in verse 25, I'm uh, sorry, um, verse 24, And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy brother hath sheep shares. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, but how be he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. Why, did, why would he want Amnon? I mean, that was his sister. You know, they're, they're, they're not half-sisters. Absalom's full-blooded sister is Tamar, and he's full-blooded hot right now with anger. And the Bible says, the king says to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go. And so he's not going. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Abnon go with us. And the king said unto him, why should he go with thee? The king knows something's going on. Well, well, of all people, why would you want Amnon? And Absalom pressed him that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Amnon had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye that when Amnon's heart is merry with wine... And when I say unto you, smite Amnon and kill him, fear not. Have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. So he's planning this whole thing out. It's premeditated murder. But he's like, there's no justice. So I'm going to go ahead and make justice. So he's telling these guys, you know what I'm going to do? I want you to officially... I need you to kill this guy, Amnon. Now, before we kill him, though, we got to make him drunk. Let's get him slossed. Have you ever seen somebody that, you know, I, I mean, if you were to pull up, like, Andy Griffith, have you ever seen somebody like Otis? You remember that? That old show? The Town Drunk? You know, he's always walking around and having a hard time and trying to grab things. I can imagine that's where, that's where this guy Amnon is. He is out. He cannot fight. He has a hard time even standing up. And so the Bible tells, um, he says, let's do this. We're going to be valiant. And the servants of Amnon did as, a sorry, as servants of Absalom did as Amnon uh, did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, every man got him upon his mule and fled. And it came to pass as they were on the way that tidings came to David, saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons, and there is none of them left. Now, had this happened, stuff like this before? You bet. If you look at, at history, there's been times where there's someone that wants to rise into power, so what do they do? They kill all the offspring. So I'm the only one left. Oh, guess who gets to stay in power? You know, yeah, I did it by a bad thing, but guess what? I've got the power now. And this has happened in history quite a few times. And so when David hears it, he doesn't, he doesn't even hesitate. He thinks... This has happened. And verse 4 says, um, or sorry, 30 says, uh, chapter 13, verse 30, that they are all dead. The tidings comes out. Then verse 31, the king arose and tore 
his, or sorry, tear his garment and lay it on the earth with all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And who comes in? Amnon's friend, Jonadab. The son of Shimea, David's brother, and answered and said, Let not my lord suppose they have slain all the young men of the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, um, Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. What kind of a friend are you? As Absalom found, um, Amnon found out, Jonadab did give bad advice. You know, I, I got to tell you, are, are you a Christian in name only? You guys, you guys hear that there's an acronym now? I, I discovered that a, about a couple of years ago. They say they're a, I've heard this two times, a couple times, a dino and a rhino. You guys have heard that before? A dino and a rhino. Interesting comparison. And that means that they are a Democrat in name only or a Republican in name only. So that means they get into the office, then there people are like, oh, yay, you know, you're going to do what you said you did. And they're like, uh, guess what? No, I'm not. I just did this to get in here, and now I'm going to do what I want to do. And they get elected in. And i got to ask you, are you a, I don't know if you would say it, a sino or a kino? Are you a Christian in name only? Are, are not by actions, but are you just, do you tell people, oh, I am a Christian, but do you have no evidence to back it up? Are you a Jonadab, distracting others from Christ? Or are you a Jonathan? Remember I told you I had two friends. That one friend, and I, and I can honestly tell you, that was the first time I ever had a, um, a friend that encouraged me so much in Christ. Um, as, a, as a young kid, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have this, uh, you know, we, we always had to use landlines and, and we would actually set up times in our youth group to do sort of like what we would consider today a conference call. Now, what would we be doing on those conference calls? We would be praying. People would look at us and think, these are teenagers. They're not. They're doing bad stuff on these conference calls. You know, they're, they're plotting, you know, what, whose house are they going to TP and, you know, and, and you know, doing, doing these bad things. But no, we were just getting on the phone pleading with God for a revival. We were pleading with God that could we see more people come to know him. We were pleading with God for family members, for friends that we knew weren't saved. And it was all because of that godly friend. When that friend left, some of that, he, he went to another state. And I got to tell you, sadly, the decline in our youth group started. And that was when I started actually hanging around that other friend. And it was a back and forth, back and forth. Got to tell you, when I was hanging out, and being around that godly friend, I was on cloud nine. Everything was wonderful. I mean, really, when I was around that one friend that wanted me to, to encourage me to be around Christ, yeah, there were trials. Yeah, there were, there were things that were going on in, our, in my life that was not ideal. But I had so much of a closer walk. Like, the, the best way I could describe it was like I was in an actual conversation and I could feel God's presence. Our youth group was amazing. When we got in there, it was just like I could feel God's presence. But when I drifted further and further from God, 
what happened to me? I got angrier. You know, anger, you don't, you don't get much anger when you hang around godly people. You know, I started listening to the wrong stuff. That changed my perspective on what, what, what was right and what was correct. I started looking at the wrong things. I just, I started declining more and more away from what God wanted for my life. You know, it was all the way up until right, really, I was right around 21, 22, when God finally got a hold of my heart again. I've got to tell you, I missed that person that was encouraging me in Christ. Now, I've got to ask you, this is a really, and this is something that only you can answer. Are you a Jonadab? Or are you a Jonathan? I can't answer that. Only you can. Are you trying to say, well, here's how we sneak around. Here's how, we, here's how we deceive that person. Here's how we get what we want. Or are you saying, this is what I feel like God wants. When your friends go to you, do they, do they know that they're going to get a sermon? Or are they going to get some shenanigans? Are they going to get the oracles of God's knowledge are they going to go to you and get knowledge from God from the Bible? Or are they going to get knowledge from the devil? I can't make that answer. Only you can. Today I challenge you as, as Christians, as hopefully as Christians, you, if you all claim to be Christians, are you a good example? I pray that you are. I pray that today that we have, that we have a, a perfect audience of people that are living the exact Christian life exactly as the way God leads it. But if you aren't, i got to tell you, it's not too late. You know, the devil, is, oh, he, oh, he wants to tell you he's too late. You know, the devil likes to remind me almost every single day of all the bad things that I've done. Of how wicked I am. He wants to remind me how bad and how wicked. But you know what? God, there's a different story here. God wants to let me know that he already died and paid for that sin. I've got to tell you, if you right now are on that cusp of like, well, I could do what I want to do. I could do what God wants me to do. I challenge you today. Give your life to God. You will not be disappointed. You're not going to go to bed at night thinking, man, I just wish. I just wish I gave the devil just a little bit more. Not going to happen. You know, today, I got to tell you, the best decision in my life was to get rid of my Jonadab. I challenge you, if you've got a Jonadab in your life, leave them. Get rid of them. And if you've got a Jonathan, embrace them. I challenge you, if you are going to be any sort of a Christian today, don't be a Jonadab. Be a Jonathan for Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this, this uh, blessing. Lord, of a, of a message, God, and Lord, a very trying one. God, Lord, there's many of us, Lord, that we try, and I, I, I know personally I try to be a Jonathan for you. But so many times, God, I feel like I'm a Jonadab. God, I pray, Lord, that uh, your people, if they're holding anything back from you, God, if they're holding any part of their life back, if they're, uh, if they're, if they personally know what, that you want them to be a Jonathan and, they, and they're going completely against you, Lord, that, that you would just, just convict them. 
Lord, that uh, they need to they need to follow you. Lord, that, that, that they need to embrace you. Lord, I pray, God, that we could lead people to you and not distract them. God, and I pray, Lord, right now, if there's anyone here that's not saved, Lord, that they would do the most important thing. And, Lord, that's invite Jesus into their heart. But, Lord, if there's any Christians here that have sort of pushed you out of their heart, Lord, if they've just pushed you a little bit away, and, Lord, you're just waiting to, to kind of commune with them again, God, I pray that they would just forgive the ask you, Lord, to forgive them of that sin that they've, they've pushed you out for, and, and Lord, that they would just invite you back in today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, uh, our, our colleagues, our, our friends, Lord, that they would look at us and, Lord, see Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you and praise you for all you've done and all you're doing in our church. We just ask you to continue to use us for your honor and glory, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it all.